What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Today on the Mindless Horror Podcast, we have a very, very special guest. Uh, for anyone who's been following the channel for some time, you know I love this movie so much. Uh, I've been wanting it to come to Horror Nights, and when it finally did, every night that I went, I had to go through it at least once. Uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space, such a great movie. One of my favorite horror movies of all time, if not my favorite horror movie of all time. And today we have a very special guest. Today we have with us... Mike himself, Grant Kramer. How you doing, man? Good, brother. How you doing, Andrew? Uh, I'm doing really good, man. Uh, you know, you are a very talented person, man. You are doing it all right now. You are acting. You are producing. Like, how's it going with with you know with COVID going on? How how's producing going right now, and 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 filmmaking going right now? Because I know that you know there's a lot of restrictions, a lot of things going on in the world. How are you guys? How are you guys doing it? Well, you know. Um, it's tough, um, but I was, I got really, really lucky. We finished, you know, uh, I, the last movie that I was producing, we finished shooting on March 3rd. Right. And uh, oh. so I got, I got home on about the 6th. And as you know, by like that week is when the whole country shut down. Right. So we got like just under the wire. Right. And, yeah. uh, so that doesn't mean that I still haven't had to deal with like, you know, we were supposed, you know, the movie should have been done a couple months ago and we're probably not going to be finished till December. Um, just because we've made the entire movie remotely, you know, there's, you know, we, we, there's no facility to go into. So from editing it, the music, uh, the VFX, like everybody who's working remotely out of their homes. And I, <laughs> so it's kind of a trip right. to be, to be posting an entire movie and never actually be in the room with one single person one time. You right. know what I mean? Yeah, no, I can only imagine. I mean, it seems like when this whole thing broke out, just when everything shut down, it was just like, okay, uh, what about stuff that's, you know, big blockbuster movies and everything that are ready to come out and they just got put on hold. Everything just got put on hold or pushed back and everything keeps getting pushed back and, you know, uh, and I, I believe the movie you're referring to is obviously uh, one coming soon. Uh, Wally's was it Wally's Wonderland? Well, it was Wally's Wonderland. It has now been changed to Willie's Wonderland. Willie's so, Wonderland, right? So um, yeah, so it's it's pretty cool. Um, it's basically you know Nicolas Cage is like this drifter loner who gets. Uh, who finds himself in this small podunk town and being thrown into a third rate Chuck E. Cheese for the night <laughs> where he has to clean the place up. And um, the animatronics have been possessed by uh, demonic, the demonic owners that used to own the place. Right. And um, they come alive and uh, like they've done many, many times before, try to kill him. But you know, maybe this time they picked the wrong guy. I know, man. I mean, you got you got him going up against Ghost Rider, so it's like, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's what do you mean? Cool. He's, he's best fun. known for Con Air. Con Air, man. Bro, Con go. Air. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah, I was just watching Con Air the other night. Yeah, it's. It, it, I I I love Nicolas Cage. I mean, one of my favorite, uh, another one of my favorite movies he did was uh, Drive Angry, uh, and he was this, you know, this guy coming back from hell to give vengeance and all that, and. You know, when you get a guy like this who lately has been making a name for himself with with the uh, the horror genre, uh, you know, coming up and doing Mandy, you know, I think he did a movie called Mom and Dad. Uh, he's been, he did Colorado Space, call, which yeah, is kind of sci-fi horror, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, he's he's been making a name for himself with all these movies, and they're they're good. Well, you know, Nick Nick is a is a trippy dude, right? He's uh, you know, we're, we we feel really lucky to have got him in a movie like this because how often do you get a an Academy Award winning actor right. whose skills are really still at the top of their game and who wants to do and is going to bring his A game to a low budget, trippy, culty, fun horror movie, right? Um, so, you know, like I said, you know, I... I I've worked with a lot of actors, a lot of different movie stars, but I, I don't know if I've ever worked with anybody who's much easier to work with and 
you know, Nick's one of those guys, he shows up on time every single day. He's friendly to everybody. And, um, and he's completely prepared. You know what I mean? I mean, he didn't show up and go, Oh, I'm doing willies. I'm not doing national treasure. I'm not doing a hundred million dollar movie. I'm doing this little movie. He showed up and, and treated it like, like every day was the most important day. And, uh, so I think we got really lucky to get Nick because there's not too many people that can really make a movie like this work. Right. No, I agree. I mean, I'm always about like I filmmaking is something that since I was a kid watching action movies, watching horror movies and stuff is like just always something I've been passionate about. Like, you know, one of my favorite directors of all time, Quentin Tarantino, like anything that guy puts out, I watch, you know, and it's like I, I see different styles of filmmaking and all that. And, you know, I just. I look at movies like Reservoir Dogs or like, you know, the first, like the very first movies that ever these big directors have done, such small budget movies, and they end up being like super freaking successful. And so I think like, when I think of that, I'm just like, I'm just grateful for things that I've gotten the opportunity to do. And hopefully future endeavors will lead me to that, to that route eventually one day, you know, so... Super stoked. Sweet. Well, you've got a good thing going now. Yeah. Hey, by the way, I'll, I'll show you something since I see you've got a lot of the uh, toys I've got. There he is, the man right there. Oh, nice. That is beautiful. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. I keep him right there in front of my shelf. <laughs> That's awesome. So, Talk to us a little bit about going from uh, acting to the producing world, man. I mean, you obviously had made a name for yourself in front of the camera, and now you're taking stuff a little bit behind the scenes. And talk to us about that transition, man. How has it been transitioning to the to from the acting world to the producing world? Well, you know, it was kind of a multi-step process. Um, you know, the first thing I did while I was still acting, I – I kind of started getting burnt out a little bit and I started teaching acting for a little while, you know, and, um, and, uh, and then when I went to kind of get back into acting, right. I just took kind of, not that I ever got completely out, but I just kind of, like I said, I just kind of got burned out a little bit. And I, and so I was teaching for a few years. I had, you know, a lot of kind of well-known clients, you know, I mean, students, you know, like Jeremy Renner was one of my students that I found in a little workshop up in Modesto and, and uh, Brian White, I don't know if you know, who he is, you know, Laura Layton, different right. people like that. But um, then when I decided to get back into it, I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it in like the swingers way, right? I'm going to write, I'm going to start writing. And I'm going to write part for me to act in. And, uh, and in doing that, I all of a sudden realized like, wow, this is kind of cool. You know, I don't have to, when you're writing, you can get, get up in the morning and write and, and uh, you don't need to wait for somebody to give you a job and you're not, you know, wrestling against somebody else every single day, uh, to, you know, to get that job. And, and um, so, and, and then the funny thing that happened is when I was be writing something, I would be really into it. And then my, when my agents would call and say, Hey, I've got an audition for you. There's a sitcom and there's a guest star. And I would be going like, wait a second, I'm writing a character going to do something really cool. And like, I don't want to leave to go. So my agents started getting mad at me because I would not want to leave what I was doing to go. Right. My priorities started to change. And then when I actually kind of started to get, you know, somewhat good at writing and I optioned some scripts to producers. And then, you know, what happens is a producer says, is, you know, they feed you a lot of hype and then they, they say, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. But as soon as they have their first little bloody nose of somebody saying this, not for me, they kind of get disappointed in most producers and they move on to the next project, right? And, and so, but now you've given them an option. So your script is kind of stuck there. So what I did is I found myself picking up the telephone and making calls, you know, saying, you know, trying to help the producer produce his movie. And um, not knowing that I was like, you know, on the road to starting to produce. And um, I'd always been kind of making, you know, short movies in the backyard and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So I was always into things behind the camera. I mean, even when I was an actor, I was that guy that was always 
when the cameraman would set up a shot, I would run over and like look through the lens and I wanted to see what he was seeing. And when I w wasn't acting, I would want to be sitting behind and seeing what the other actors were doing. And, and as you could see, I was as interested in coaching actors as I was in acting myself. And so, but in doing that, like all of a sudden, other writer friends of mine saw, the, saw what I was doing and would say, hey, I've got this script and I just got it back from this producer, blah, 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 blah. It came back to me. Would you take a look at it? Maybe you want to start making some calls on this too. And before I know it, along with the writing, I was now producing. Um, and uh, so it kind of, it kind of happened organically. Right. And then what happens is like when you start making money doing that and you start getting busy and you start getting creatively involved, um, it's harder to keep on running back and, and, and like you said, leaving everything because if you're an actor, unless you're like already a big star to the point where people are just calling you and saying, Hey, I got a script. Would you want to read it? And you want to, sh and uh, you know, you got a million bucks and you show up on blah, blah, blah. Right. It means you have to be ready to at the drop of a hat run to that audition and that callback and that second callback and that third callback and blah, 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 blah. I think it's gotten a little easier now because most actors go to less auditions and they put themselves on, on tape. But at the time that I was making the transition, you know, you had to fight LA traffic for an hour and a half for every one of the, you know, if it was Kellogg's commercial, you're, you're in your car for two hours, right? And then two hours back and like the whole day is shot for a stupid commercial you didn't get, right? <laughs> and I was like, I was getting to that point in my life where I like, I wanted my time to make sense. And I was also getting frustrated with constantly having something that you think is going to be the breakout role that leads to the next thing. And then, it, you know, whether it does or doesn't, you're kind of back starting up again. So it just, you know what I mean? It just kind of happened by, I still love to act. Um, but, um, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, the, the producing just started to be something that made more sense to me. Um, and, uh, you know, and pr probably, you know, and I've done a little directing as well, and probably the directing is something I'm going to start focusing a little bit more on because lately I've been working, you know, I've worked with a lot of big directors, you know, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've mentored with Scorsese and, uh, uh, you know, some, uh, Richard Rush, you know, who was a very famous director, directed the Stuntman and some other great movies. And, um, and, uh, you know, I've worked, I've produced movies with Rob Reiner and Roger Donaldson and some like pretty well-known people, but lately I've been making movies with some younger directors where they don't really know when, when younger directors, when you're working with, they don't really know what they're doing. You're kind of mentoring them. And I like doing that. But once again, just like teaching acting, when you do it for a while and then you go, God, I'm working harder than the director is. I'm di actually directing more than the director is. Why don't I just, like, I just need to find my next movie to direct. You know what I mean? So I think that's probably where my next focus, I'm not going to stop producing, but um, I'll, I'm probably going to start finding some projects. I'm already looking at a couple right now that would be projects to, uh, to actually direct so that I'm not like, you know, guiding somebody else's vision. I actually putting my vision out there. Definitely. That seems like a really great next move. Um, thinking back to the beginning, when, when did you know you wanted to get into like the entertainment industry? You know, it's weird. You know, it's like, you know, my mom was an actress. Uh, my mom's name is Terry Moore. I don't know if you know she is, but if you ever saw movies like Mighty, the original Mighty Joe Young, she was a, uh, she was Jill Young and she, you know, she has a, had an Academy Award nomination. She was in like, a, you know, tons of big 50s movies. And so I was around the business growing up, but I never really got into it. Um, and, uh, but it was, it was, so it was never something that was foreign to me because I grew up, you know, around movie sets and things like that. Uh, and then I, when I, I was at UCLA, you know, I was 17 years old, you know, going to UCLA as like an econ major. And I started, yeah. 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 Sammy's, I an, econ. Sammy's an econ major. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I said, I, but what happened is like, I started getting into acting a little bit and, um, 
eventually I, uh, I got an agent on the side and I, and I, and he sent me out on an audition and I got my first movie, which was a, um, a little horror movie called New Year's Evil. I don't know if you ever saw that one. But, I am um, very well aware of what that is, man. <laughs> and, uh, but that kind of gave me the bug. And, um, you know, from there, I just, you know, I started, can I continue to do acting, take acting classes and do local theater and stuff like that. And, um, and then, you know, I mean, obviously had a pretty nice run for a while. And um, until I started to kind of, you know, listen, there's a certain point where, you know, what's, what's cool with you in your twenties, maybe becomes a little bit less cool in your thirties. And if you're not I, I made some decisions along the way to pass on work because I was trying to kind of upgrade my work and that either works out for you or doesn't, right? And if it doesn't work, now you've kind of set yourself back a little bit further than you were to begin with. And um, I just got kind of, like I said, I got tired of the auditioning. I got tired of running around town and sitting in a room with 20 other actors and all that kind of thing and restarting, restarting the career. And I started looking at other things, but you know, it's the only business I've ever been in. So, um, besides, you know, as an actor, you do a lot of side jobs along the way when you need to. But uh, it's the only actual business I've ever been in. So, you know, now, I mean, I've, I've probably done every movie, every practically every job on the set. I, uh, you know, I, what, you know, like on this last movie, I, I, I'm produced, but. I also, you know, did a fair amount of kind of behind the scenes writing on the movie. I directed second unit. I, you know, played one of the parts in the movie. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's more fun to me the, the entire creative process now than it is just to be, you know, I'm not trying to be a star anymore. You know what I mean? Definitely. And that can be kind of frustrating, you know, because how many people out of all the thousands and thousands and thousands of actors that are trying to become a big star actually you know, become Brad Pitt or something, right? Right. No, yeah, I, I get you on that, man. Um, but I, I, I'm liking the so far that we've, from what we heard from you, just your story, man, of just how passionate you are about not only, you know, the acting side of things, but of course the, the behind the scenes. I mean, I say it time and time again, but one of my favorite things is I love watching behind the scenes of things of how movies were made and, you know, how, how it was behind the scenes. Like, I always say it, the first thing I do when I get a DVD is watch the behind the scenes, you know, because I've seen the movie, but I want to see now how it's been made. And I love hearing set stories. I love hearing uh, if there was any complications about how they did things. Of course, the most famous complications in cinema history, everyone knows, was, of course, with Jaws, the, the shark not working in the water, and it cost him like a whole year of production, and... So like I like hearing stuff like that because it, there's always challenges. That Actually, arise. probably the number one was probably the Johnny Depp movie, um, which was uh, Lost in La Mancha. Right. Yeah. You know, because that one they kept on having problem after problem, and then that one never got made. Right. Right. <laughs> but no. yes, Jaws is right up there with it. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, and it it's just it's fun to hear these stories of of how movies got made. I mean, it it, it really gives you like for me who just loves film and just is a movie buff and wants to do this one day. Like it just gives you a, a kind of insight of how certain directors are when making movies and how everyone's involved with it and everything. I mean, one of my, again, one of my favorites, like I keep saying, Quentin Tarantino, Christopher Nolan, like these guys right here are just some of the people that I truly look Did up to. Did you go to. see Tenet yet? I have not. And I want to so bad. I really I haven't seen to. it yet either. I, I want to my see wife it. Won't, my wife won't let me go to the theater yet, but uh, I want to go see it really bad. Sammy, I know you saw it. Yes, I did. Thought I, was it good? Yeah. Oh, it was really good. It was really good. I recommend was it, it. Was it as good as the first one? Was it as good as the first? I've never seen the first one. I didn't know there was oh, the first uh, one. Uh, what's, uh, what's Christopher Nolan's other movie? Uh, the one with Leonardo DiCaprio. The, uh, uh, why am I blanking? Inception. Inception. It's supposed to be kind of a sequel to Inception, right? Is it really? This is news to me. I That's gotta, what I had heard. I gotta do some research well, on that. Well, Christopher, I mean, it does deal with time, and Christopher Nolan is definitely known for having films that deal with time. Um, Memento is what got him going, right? So yeah. Right. So I mean, Interstellar, he talks about time. Tenet, he's going to be talking about time and space, and obviously Inception. So you can, it's definitely a Christopher Nolan film. 
It's not done. I can't wait to. I can't wait to see it. I think he's so cool. You know, um, I love Christopher Nolan. Um, you know, he's such like everything is kind of a, you know, a ride and a mind twister, right? So, you just always, you just always like, you know, take that ride with him. That, that's exactly yeah. how I was through the the Dark Knight trilogy. I'm a huge Batman fan, so like watching his take on Batman, I was like, you made it where if Batman was in a real life scenario this is how it would be like. And I loved his take on it. It was dude. Awesome. Truthfully, I haven't really liked, I mean, I'm huge comic book fan, right? I, you know, I grew up being like, you know, I spent every dime of my allowance every week on Marvel comic books. Right. I know that's DC, but I, I, I read every comic book known to man, even like Richie Rich and you know, <laughs> Archie. And, uh, but I never really liked a Batman movie before Christopher Nolan started doing the Dark Dark Knight series. Wow, you didn't? You're not a big fan of Michael Keaton either. Or? No, as a matter of fact, I was like, well, my biggest problem with the with I hate to say it, my biggest problem with the Batman series, but with the, the early like the Tim the Tim Burton's, the, you know, Batman's and everything, right? Is that they were so, and this is a little, with a lot of Tim Burton's movies to me. I mean, I totally dig his. Uh, his production design and his cool, you know, the cool look of everything. But I just feel like the drama in the story is, is lacking. And so all of a sudden, you know, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of this going on with Batman, a lot of <laughs> lip piercing, yeah. a lot of really cool cars and bats and Batmobiles and dark Gotham stuff. But like, I was dying to have like a story, like you said, that felt real to me and where I felt like, you know, I felt like I really understood Batman's plight and you know what I mean? And, and where the drama was real for me. And that was the, the dark Knight was the first one that I really felt that way. Definitely. Um, and, uh, it, you know, I was always looking for that and, you know, look, there's a lot, I mean, did I enjoy the movies? Yeah. You know, because Jack Nicholson was unbelievably cool as the Joker in one in the early movies. I even enjoyed the ones with, you know, like, uh arnold schwarzenegger is the ice man you know what i mean yeah but you know because they're just because i just like comic book movies but they were always left me wanting you know what i mean because i just said why can't you make a batman movie where i you really like where you really feel the drama and you really feel the conflict and then all of a sudden christopher nolan came in the picture with with uh christian bale and there it was right yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, yeah, the the first, like the 89, I, I, I really like because of Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson, but I see where you're coming from as we didn't get that realistic Batman feeling in that like whole. That's why I'm really excited for the Matt Reeves one because it's going like a whole like detective dark style, like how Batman is portrayed in the comic books uh, now. And I, I that's what I loved about Nolan's work is he really, like I said, made you feel like this universe really is like it could be real by the way i was totally i was so totally disappointed with batman versus superman really like <laughs> i mean well first of all even putting them together right you've probably got the weakest superhero in history fighting the strongest superhero in history right it's like hey bat hey superman like i want to stop you you no longer exist, right? I mean, that's the reality of it. You know what I mean? So it's like My only Superman's right talk. <laughs> What's that? My dad would love you right now. He's a big Superman fan, so he would love you. Only Superman's this. tolerance towards this, towards this, you know, ant is the only thing that would give Super Batman the, even the time and the room to be able to go find some kryptonite to, you know, like the cheap shot kryptonite to kill him with, right? Because Superman could kill him from like a hundred miles away with like one shot of his heat ray. My dad, if he was listening to this right now, which I probably he's probably is listening. So, Dad, Greg Kramer just said Superman okay. would destroy Batman. And your dad, like, like what turns see, I always like to, what turns me on because I really am a massive comic book fan. Is like I'd like to see like the DC universe battle some of the people in 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 like the Marvel universe, oh, right? Like Superman would. needs to like fight with like somebody like Captain Marvel, somebody who's really, you know, somebody who's really got some some stitch it going on for themselves, right? Like Captain Marvel is probably without a doubt the most powerful 
hero. I say that because, you know, there's people like Silver Surfer that are very powerful, but they never really get a chance to be a hero because, you know, he's the servant of the planet eater Galactus. My right? God, Grant Kramer, I, you know your stuff, man. That's awesome. Like, this interview just got 10 times better right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I think to myself, if you want to turn me on, you got to get Superman fighting against Captain Marvel. You know what I mean? Because now we've got two omnipotent superheroes to go up against. Don't put it against Batman, right? I mean, if you want to fight with Batman, put, me, put him against Daredevil. You know? <laughs> Something like that. That would be, I mean... I think they did it once in comic book history where they actually had a crossover and it was legit. And if Marvel and DC really want to be the big ones in comics and really want to make a ton of money, that's where you go right there is you do a crossover to fight each other and who would actually win. Like, So are you more like a DC or, or Marvel person? So being that my dad grew up, you know, he, he's a, a massive Superman fan, diehard Superman fan. So I always grew up with DC. However, he loves the cosmic universe of Marvel. Like he loves Galactus. He loves Silver Surfer. He loves like people like, you know, Col Colossus from the X-Men and all that. So... You know, we we, we, really, we really like both. I think I'm a little bit more of a DC fan just because, I'm like I said, I'm a massive Batman fan, uh, and I like a lot of their superheroes and their storylines and stuff. But Marvel just kills it with the movies, man. Like, their movies are just You know, yeah, and I'll tell you why, I think. Because, because and this is the reason why I was always more of a Marvel fan. Like I went, And I say that with the caveat that, like I said, I love, I read every DC comic too, right? Um, but Marvel... Marvel characters were more human. They were more conflicted. They were always battling their dark side. You know what I mean? Um, you know, whereas, whereas DC characters had a tendency to be, you know, a little bit more of that superhero kind of personality with an alter ego and all that kind of thing. You know, they didn't necessarily um, you know, when you're watching a Marvel comic, you know, you'd see Iron Man constantly, you'd, see, you'd hear his inner monologue all the time, constantly wrestling with his demons and, you know, uh, you know, these characters were always half suicidal as they went through things and they're, and, you know, so you related to, to them and they felt like, like I said, really kind of broken, even the most powerful superheroes seemed like they were, they had, uh, you know, their inner workings might destroy them at any time. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, that's, I think, uh, and I'm sorry we got off topic. This is just. Not at all. I, I love I, it. You know, as uh, much as I love horror, like, I'm just the same amount of love with comic books, too. But uh, I loved when Stanley and Jack Kirby first designed these characters. They gave them, like you said, the personality that a human would feel. Like, you know, Spider-Man is this kid who you know, got bit by a radioactive spider, and now he's trying to go through high school and, and manage two lives. And he's, he's, he's just, like, riddled with angst, right? I mean, in the comics, in the early comics, Spider-Man was riddled with angst, and he's, he loves his, you know, Aunt B, and he's constantly trying to, to, you know, get the girl, figure out what to do, deal with insecurity. And there comes the Green with, Goblin. You know, <laughs> and here comes the Green Goblin, exactly, right? You know, so yes, exactly. Yeah. Or the rhino, the rhino. I know all these amazing characters, but it's cool to see that you have a comic book side in you. I would never expect that from Mr. Mike Tobacco himself, man. Like, come on, that's awesome. Oh, dude, I was, I, I like I said, that was my, that was my world growing up, man. I, I, I lived in comic books. Right, right. All, all I was thinking was when he said Daredevil. Versus Batman is Ben Affleck versus Ben Affleck. <laughs> How great would that be? That's so funny. You're right. Ben Affleck played both of them, right? Yeah. Now, what about what about Robert Pattinson is the next one, right? Who would have ever thought of Robert Pattinson you know as Batman? A lot of people, I think, and it was myself included, didn't like Twilight, obviously. But when I started watching the movies he did with A24, uh, I was blown away by his acting, and that was really was like, okay, you know what? I'm willing to give him a shot to see how he does as Batman, and when we got that first trailer, obviously we didn't get a lot of to see his acting. We got to see him more in the costume and 
like a lot of action packed scenes, being that's only like thirty percent of the film that they've they filmed, but I think he honestly is going to be a good Batman. I really do. Yeah, I listen, I'm I'm curious to see it too. Like my favorite one by far so far has been Christian Bale. Um and he's the one that seemed to actually you know, it was great seeing him in that prison, you know, like he really sold it at, in the prison, the prison scene where he beats up everybody, right? In the first Dark Knight. Um, because you go, wow, this is a guy that really, it really can mix it up physically, right? He has the physicality to do it where, you know, look, Michael Keaton, I love Michael Keaton. He's so awesome, you know, and, uh, and the other Batman, but none of them, I mean, they're all, they're all just being kind of like skinny or whatever dudes like stuck into a muscle suit, right? He was the first one that actually had the, the kind of astral physicality to, to, to really sell it. Now, Pattinson, again, kind of doesn't really have that, right? I mean, I don't know if he's kind of buffed up for this one or not, but, but yeah, I think he's, but he, he, but he's still kind of an interesting, different choice for it. So I'm curious to see what, what he does with it. And like, I agree with you too, that I didn't like the Twilight movies at all. Um, but uh, like when I was growing up, we had the Lost Boys and that was so, <laughs> Lost Boys in, in movies yeah. like, uh, what was that Kathleen Bigelow, Bigelow movie that was vampire movie that was so friggin' awesome. I really um, liked uh, the 80s Fright Night. Oh yeah, it was, that was really awesome. That was really, really good. Uh, Chris Sarandon. Yeah. yeah. Um, such a good movie. Uh, what's the other movie that I love? That I love. Uh, why am I blanking on the name? Um, Catherine Bigelow did, did it. It was starred Bill Paxton and and uh, Ooh, Paxton. And um, it was Bill Paxton and Adrian Pazdar was uh, and uh, Lance Henriksen. Um, oh, who's got a computer? They can look it up real got quick. Got some IMDb, IMDb right now. I can't even believe that I'm that I'm. Uh, just look up Kathy Bigelow. It was one of her early movies like right right before like blue steel can't was believe it? i can't remember the name of it. it's one of my favorite when did, when, va- probably you, my favorite vampire movie do you remember the release date like um year go go back to the, like the 80s okay we looking at Not you'll me. see a movie called like blue steel or something and it's right before that Catherine bigelow let me see you know who directed like you know uh Hurt Locker and all that kind of stuff. It's not Never Dark, right? No. What? Never Dark? No. Not Ever Dark, uh, but it's something like that. It's Never, called, never uh, Dark? Oh, now, now I'm really going <laughs> to... While you're looking, I'm going to look for it, too. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this, this break in the interview is sponsored by... Zampires. Near Dark. It's called Near Dark. Near Dark, okay. Near Dark, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. Near dark. Why did I say near dark? <laughs> okay. I don't know why I said never dark. Near I dark. I was like, yeah, yeah. I can't even believe. Nineteen eighty-seven, right? It. Oh, you got to see near dark. It's yeah, it's so badass. I mean, it's so cool. You, you hooked me on Bill Paxton. You know, I'm a huge Bill Paxton guy, and I he love... was another like in, phenomenally cool actor. That it's too bad that he's not here anymore. I know. It was it was a bummer when I heard. I was like the only guy to get killed by an alien and a predator. Man, come on. <laughs> oh, yeah no kidding right um grant i can't of course not talk to you without talking about killer clowns from outer space man obviously uh this role that you you pro- uh, portrayed mike man uh tell me from start how you got this role and what was it like going into this film you know it was one of those scripts when you read it you kind of just like your head kind of flips around a few times and you go like (laughs) this is pretty off the wall and weird but it's so (laughs) off the wall and weird that it could be really cool and and the funny thing was is i I, a friend of mine had just was directing this movie and he just offered me the lead in it and it was it was kind of like this uh martial arts action film you know what i mean but uh and um you know, and I was a little bit into martial arts and stuff like that. So I thought, oh, that would be fun. But then I got, in, I got, I had to make a, dis- a choice between killer clowns from outer space and he was putting major pressure on me. So I actually kind of like in a certain way, kind of like 
didn't completely kill a friendship, but kind of like did a little bit because I said, dude, I, listen, I really, I really have to do this crazy little movie. And, um, and I had to audition for, it. I don't remember how many times there was a lot of times, you know, the Kyoto brothers, the three brothers that, that, uh, wrote and directed it. They're, they're really cool visual effects guys. They're still really good friends with, uh, with us. And, um, they they kept on bringing everybody back and we don't they'd mix and match and mix and match and mix and match right and um and uh so you know i, I like i said I, it must have gone back about six times and every time i'd go back i would be there for like you know two hours while they would bring you in with this group and bring you in with that group and mix it around and put you on tape and and um so it was a trip. And then because they had to like kind of create all the creatures, once I got cast in the movie, there was probably like six months before I actually started shooting it. Um, and then we, you know, we went up to, we went up to kind of the Santa Cruz area and um, about a week ahead of time. And, um, you know, you know it, was, it was pretty cool. We shot the whole movie pretty much at nights. Um, I think we had like, I think we've maybe flipped back to days for like a few days when we went into what was shooting because we we're shooting with the interior of the spaceship that was in uh, like a big warehouse where they built all that stuff. But for the most part, we were shooting, you know, exteriors and it was all like at nighttime. And so the whole movie was night. So I was, you know, shooting four o'clock in, in, in the afternoon till, you know, six o'clock in the morning. And then, cruising back and uh, playing some Pong <laughs> and passing out, you know? But it was really fun. It was really fun. It was a blast. And and Suzanne Snyder, the girl uh, who I should, I, you should have her on your show sometime too. I she's, would she's, so much love to have all of you guys on the show actually uh, for one big one. But yeah, I would love to have her on the show. She's, uh, she's, you know, kind of like my sister now. I mean, she's, we're very, very close. And, and, uh, you know, when we go to do conventions and things like that, we always go together and, and hang out and, uh, and, uh, she's awesome. She's really, she's really cool. And so are the Kyoto's. Yeah. Um, they're, you know, we've, we've lost a few people from the movie, you know, right. uh, we lost John Vernon and we lost Royal Dano before, before John Vernon. Um, yeah. but, uh, and the one person, you know, the, the guy that played uh, Dave in the movie, right. uh, John Allen Nelson, has never, I don't know, you know, what he did with his life, but whatever it is, he's, he distanced himself from Killer Clowns. So um, I have no idea why nobody's ever, nobody ever hears from him. Everybody always, he's, people are always tracking him down, you know, and, uh, you know, trying to get him to show up to some of the cool stuff that we have going on. And, uh, you know, Suzanne and I kind of show up to everything because we, it's like a family to us, but, uh, you know, there's probably, there's probably a hundred thousand people that have like a poster or something signed with everybody that are waiting for John Allen Nelson to show up so they can fill in the blank, right? <laughs> that was definitely the Dang. same thing with the uh, actor who played Biff in Back to the Future. Uh, he would not show up to anything for years and then finally gave into it and finally showed up and... Uh, this YouTuber that I watch, he had literally the same thing. Everyone from actors to, you know, the directors, producers, all that signed on the poster but his. And when he finally got the opportunity, he's like, this is it. This is what will complete my, my thing. I have them all signed. And so. Of course. Yeah. Because everybody that has that blank spot is waiting to fill in that final gap, right? So John L. Nelson doesn't know it, but he could show up and, you know, probably make a a fortune at a few conventions just because without even having to, to do anything except sit there and have her fill in the blank for everybody that's been that has everybody else's autograph but him right the goal for me right now is i i actually had john sign that mask is eventually if i get to meet everyone you had john Al nelson no john uh Mazzari. oh john Mazzari. Yeah. okay uh, um no i <laughs> that'd be insane right <laughs> um if I, uh, that's my goal is just to get everybody to sign Fatso's mask. Um, and that would be like my, my prized collection right there. And I can, I can die happily. Well, where do you, where do you live? I'm in, uh, I'm actually living in California. I'm actually in a town called Norwalk for, uh, right outside of uh, about 30 minutes away from Los Angeles. 
that's not that far. We could probably figure out a way for to get me to sign your mask. Oh my God. Don't tell me that <laughs> <laughs> this interview already. I was already going in all day. Like this is a big one for me. I don't want to mess this up. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can ask Sammy. I'm, I'm fanboying hard right now. This is, yeah, this is just a dream come true right now. Honestly. <laughs> yeah. He's, I think he's called me like four times. Hey, uh, am I dreaming or is this really happening? Um, oh man well listen you know you never know you just reach out to people you know you never know like i'm i'm a pretty normal person and i love killer clowns and i love people that are doing stuff like you're doing so like i said you never know you just reach out i mean listen you know you, i i guess i could have been just like a raging asshole and said oh who the hell are you reaching out right but you know what i mean uh i just i imagine that probably that more people or not are pretty cool right i just i really just from the bottom of my heart thank you for giving Someone who's watched this movie since he was a kid, growing up and like just seeing the clown ship, and then finally when it came to Horror Nights last year, I was like, I'm actually in the clown ship. Like this is unreal. They did a great job, right? Did you get to go through that, by the way? I want to talk to you. About I that. did. I actually went. Uh, I went the same night as the Kyotos did. We went on like the opening night, and um, I actually went through it twice because my wife is, even though she loves the movie and has seen it, she was, she was, she's she's hypersensitive to being scared right so so she made me go through it once so that i could tell her where everybody was going to jump out the second time <laughs> right okay there's a guy that's going to jump out right now and scare you right so don't be scared and she's still like okay he's coming out right now right now he's a guy in a blue suit he's jumping out right now like she's still <laughs> She's just like super hypersensitive to, to being scared. So she can't watch horror movies. But, but the, ironically, Killer Clowns is one of the few movies that she's, you know, because it's not really super horror. It's kind of sci-fi horror, trippy. Um, but she loves Killer Clowns. But she was still, she was still scared to go through the thing. But I thought they did an awesome job. Right. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It, it was basically, at least the Hollywood one I can speak on, was basically like walking through the movie from beginning to end um we'll just seen just scene by scene which was so cool um what would you say your favorite part has been since filming this movie my you mean you mean since i filled it what's my favorite part of the movie well no like your favorite part like have you had like you know do you enjoy like, the fan interactions do you like re-watching the film now what's where, where yeah, are you no this? you know no actually Actually, yeah, it's the fan interactions. You know, my favorite part is to get together with Suzanne and John Masari and the Kyoto brothers. And there's, you know, there's a few other guys, Mike Martinez and stuff that sometimes show up uh, when we have like reunions and stuff. There were guys that were like in the, the clown suits, stunt guys that were in the clown suits. And to be hanging out together and meeting all the fans, because there's a sense that like, wow, man, like we created something that made people, that made people happy and is still turning people on today. Do you know what I mean? So there's that great kind of camaraderie of being with them, but then interacting with all of the, the fans and stuff. And the thing that really, that really turns me on is, uh, you know, when I see, you know, 15 year olds, 18 year olds, 20 year olds that come in and they're like, you gotta see my tattoo. You know, my, I got a clown tattoo and I, and I love your movie. And I'm like, the fact that it's like jumping generations um, is so awesome. Uh, you know, and I think in a lot of ways, Killer Clowns is probably more popular today. You know, it, the, the popularity of Killer Clowns, I don't think it's ever it's constantly crept up. It's never, it hasn't started its decline, you know, which that's what I think is the really cool thing about it. And hopefully it never will, you know, hopefully it'll always have that evergreen type of uh, feel to it, you know, cause it's just so cool and so off the wall and so original. Right. And yeah, I, I'll go for it. Go ahead, Sammy. Yeah. Yeah. I agree that I, I think it's just an ever climbing, ever growing fan base. Um, one of my buddies, when I told him that, you know, we had, locked you down for an interview he was just going berserk he was like what you mean like you're actually going to talk to to mike i was like yeah we're gonna 
we're gonna talk to him and you know have him on the show he's like that's my favorite movie of all time i'm like that is so wild like that you know that that's your favorite movie and i'm just gonna be able to talk to this guy and then when i had told him that's that, so we, awesome. had, we had hung i had told him i was like oh yeah well you know we've had john nazari on the show he's like that's the composer i was like bro you really like this film and i, I think there's a very diehard fan for these films for the oh, film. dude. well actually you know it's really funny because um the guy who's composing the music for Wally's Wonderland, Willie's Wonderland, is uh, a buddy of mine uh, named Aaron Robinson. And um, I met him, ironically, when I was, uh, sh- I was shooting a, I was going to make this, I was making like six episodes of, if you can believe it, I was directing this little cooking show. But it was a really off the wall cooking show. It was like a cooking show for guys, like, you know, teaching guys how to make food that so they don't have to make spaghetti when they have a date or something like that right so they teach him how to make really cool stuff right and uh so i I needed a young hip hip chef somebody who was really cool and chef and so somebody said oh there's this guy and he works at a visual effects house but you know he's a musician he's in a rock band he had two songs in the on the underworld soundtrack and you should go see him but but you have to go to his place because you the visual effects house where he works because he because he has a day job he can't come to the audition so i knock on the door and he opens up the door and i have the camera in front of my face right i'm going to start auditioning him <laughs> right right off the get so you can't see my face and i'm talking to him and i'm like oh so you're Aaron, and he starts yeah and he starts talking to me and all of a sudden he stops he goes wait a second wait a second move that camera away from your face I hear Mike Tobacco, <laughs> and like he, and I'm like, I'm like, what? Like he recognized me from my voice, and I'm like, how did you know that was the guy? And I'm the guy that played Mike Tobacco. You would even have a camera in front of my face. He goes, I heard your voice. That's my favorite movie of all time. And he started reciting the words, but that you know, that was like ten years ago. So over the years, he's become one of my, you know best friends and along the way he became like a big kind of a really successful com- composer for commercials and he was like and he was kept on saying to me like dude can you do anything to help me get a j- my i want to get out of commercial not necessarily get out complete but i want to be doing something more creative i want to be doing films and um so when i got willie's Wally, willie's wonderland off the ground <laughs> it was so fun to be able to give him that call because I knew because he loved Killer Clowns so much and was so dying to do a film that giving him a, a crazy movie with Nicolas Cage battling animatronics, that was about as close to Killer Clowns as you could get, right? Right, no. And I, like I said, I love that concept, man. I, I'm so stoked to watch that movie. I can't wait till it comes out. Um, I actually got to talk to one of my guys. I, we have a whole crew here on the Nights of Horror. Uh, we have like, there's five of us. And um, one of our guys, his name is Logan. Uh, he's a huge fan. He's our physical media guy, so he buys all the DVDs. He's got a big old physical media collection. Uh, we actually just released a video um, that – this is a future video, so it came out last Saturday, but it, it hasn't came out yet just for us. But, um, yeah, he, he just you know shared his whole physical media uh, top watches for Halloween. Uh, he actually texted us a couple of questions because, you know he like I said, he is a fan, and he goes – uh, hope you're doing well, Grant. It's uh, cool to see that you know we got you on the show. Uh, he goes, "What do you think about?" And you kind of answered this, but what do you think about Killer Clowns from Outer Space still having such a devoted cult fan base? And were you surprised to see it get somewhat of a resurgence in captivating and a new, a younger audience? Well, it's funny. Yeah, I, Logan, I think I, I think I hopefully kind of answered your question already. I mean, I think it's the coolest thing ever. Right. Um. I love, you know, I've kind of grown with the movie. Um, you know, actually, like when I made the movie, I thought it was really cool, but I was so busy trying to, to have this this serious acting career that I didn't really have as much fun with it as I maybe could have back then. Um, and uh, so I've really like let myself just enjoy it more and more and more over the years. And like I said, when I, when I do see like all the young fans, 
I love it. It gets me really, it gets me really kind of excited and turned on that, that so many people are, that so many younger people are, are finding it and being turned on to it by what, you know, either finding it themselves or being turned on to it by their parents or, um, you know, whoever it happens to be. And, uh, and it really ends this movie now. And, um, I'm still hoping that somewhere along the line where, you know, we've got a sequel that we've been trying to make for a while and that, uh, maybe we'll, we'll get it off the ground. It's, I wrote the script to it actually. And I, I, I worked over the story with the Kyoto's and then I wrote the script and we were pretty close to getting it off the ground once. So hopefully we still will. Mike. Um, oh, I wanted to tell you too, I've got a movie that, um, that, uh, I produced that I was an executive producer on and, um, involved with, with the distribution. It's, it's kind of a cool, um, you know, kind of found footage style horror movie. It's called followed. And uh, we, we released in drive-ins over the summer and we were number one in the country for a couple of weeks. And uh, we just came out um, on, on uh, all the pay-per-views, you know, Amazon and Fandango and iTunes and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, so it's pretty cool. It's, it's, about, uh, it's about like a social media influencer who in order to get followers decides to go spend the night at this, um, you know, we call it something different. It's, it's called, we call it the Hotel Lennox, but it's a, there's a famous real hotel in downtown LA. I don't know if you've heard about it. There's a lot of like, un, like unsolved mysteries. There was, there was a, a girl um, that uh, was in the elevator and uh, she, they have the, the, the footage of her in the elevator and she's looking, somebody's following her, somebody's coming after her and then she disappeared. And like three months later, they found her on the roof of the hotel. People started complaining that the water was smelling and tasting funky. And they went up to the water tanks and there's massive things. It takes like four people just to lift them off. And she was in there drowned in the water tank. Like how did, how did she get in there? What happened to her? And the same hotel, like Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, and these other serial killers have stayed there. And so it's truly like one of those haunted hotel places. So he says, I'm going to go and stay there to be, you know, and get, to get followers. And of course, what happens is he ends up, you know, descending into, you know, both like, you know, evil spirits and demons and a combination of that and his own madness. And, uh, but it's kind of a commentary on social media and the whole craziness of it all too. But so, um, if you haven't seen it yet, please, it's, uh, Check it out, rent it. It's going to be on, you know, at least you know through Halloween and stuff like that. It's called Followed, and uh, very cool. Payday's next low week, budget, so, super I mean, cool movie. Yeah, that's something to get me into the Halloween mood right there. You know it, <laughs> uh, Mike. Before I let you go, I have to ask you for a favor to do one thing because it's something that I love in this movie a lot that you say. Another door. There it is. <laughs> He knew it was he coming. He knew it right away. <laughs> Another door. Like, thank you. Another oh, door. Brad, yes. <laughs> oh, my God. You can ask Sammy. Every time I went through that maze, when we went through oh. that scene, that was something I yelled every single time. Oh, every another time. Door. Another door. Another door. Another <laughs> door. Uh, Grant Kramer, I, I applaud you so much for giving us a chance to uh, have this interview. I mean, just learning so much about you beyond Killer Clowns. I mean, obviously, that's where I first saw you from. And, you know, as a little kid growing up, wanting to push the same buttons you did on the elevator of the, the spaceship. And then seeing you and, and the whole cast fight these clowns and when I was a kid, terrified of them. But then as I grow up, I'm like, these, these clowns are funny, like, but they're also evil, like, you know, and, um, and I think just growing up with this movie is just been honestly something that I can't wait when I have kids of my own to pass down to because awesome. I love it. I no, love it. Yeah, it's, it's so cool. I mean, I think I turned Sammy onto it the other day when I remember you guys did a live stream about a month ago. Um, with the entire cast and uh, and the director and John, and I was watching along at home, and my buddy was here, and he had never seen the movie, and like he was on his phone, but he was really paying attention and everything, and he was like, when I when I when he, when he saw the another door scene, he was like, 
that was probably the funniest and coolest thing I've ever heard. Like, that was like, he, I remember just watching it and he go, and I told him about when I got you on the show, he was like, yeah, I've been wanting to watch that movie again because it actually caught my interest. And I'm like, yeah, it's a good movie. <laughs> you should, uh, you should watch it. It's, it's really good. Um, but you honestly, you, the whole cast, I, I applaud the casting crew for making this movie because I think this was like the, the movie that really truly turned me on to horror and kind of got over my fear of clowns. I mean, this was something when I watched, I mean, from the Dickies opening song, you know, Killer Clowns from Outer Space, which I still, when I'm at work, I play, I blast it out loud. And, you know, you can ask anybody that I know when I always talk about Killer Clowns, they're like, oh, here he goes again. It's like, you guys don't understand. Like, I have a special relationship with this movie that growing up, this was the movie. And as an adult, when it finally came to Horror Nights, I was just in heaven walking through the spaceship. I was like, I never thought I'd be able to walk through the spaceship. Cotton candy cocoons, never thought I'd see those, you know? Walking through the police station, I was like, never got to, you know, all these things, and it's all thanks to not only you, but all the casting crew that helped bring this project to life. So I want to thank you so much for giving us such an amazing treasure that we can hopefully carry on for decades to come. Oh, well, I, thank you, man. I really appreciate it. And I had a blast being on the show. And thank you for asking me, you yeah. know. And uh, anytime you want me to come back, let me know. And if if you need me to connect you with any of the other guys from the show, happy to do that as well. That would be and, awesome. Uh, and, uh, you know, when Willie's comes out, uh, let me know. And we'll uh, hook you up with anybody you want to talk to from there, too. Oh, my God. That would be so awesome, man, because... I would love to help you promote that any way I can. Um, it honestly sounds like an amazing movie, and I can't wait to see it. Um, so, Grant, thank you for bringing Mike to life. Thank you for doing all the amazing producing and behind-the-scenes directing, everything that you do now, for keeping horror alive and keeping the love of cinema. And don't ever stop being a nerd because that was the coolest thing I heard all day today. Of you talking, about uh, I can't. Books. I can't help it, man. I'm a nerd for life. <laughs> oh, so we we all are here. We all are. <laughs> um, no, I I really uh, think so. But if I can leave it with one last question, obviously we heard that you wrote the script, so you are very much opening to reprising the role of Mike for a sequel if it ever came about. Oh yes, oh yes. I, I, I'm I'm a kind of like the mentor, somewhere between. Uh, Somewhere between the doc and Back to the Future and uh, Chris Christopherson and Blade, I become kind of like the the mentor to the young guys in the sequel. So teaching them how to shoot the nose, kill the clown. Yeah, that's uh, I could see like a whole Ash vibe with you guys. They come back and you guys get like Ash Williams on them from Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2 and all that. Totally. You guys are all ready to go and. Totally. Uh, I am so stoked if when and if this movie comes out, I for sure will be there because that is not something I'm going to miss. And awesome. I hope this movie gets made because I think fans all around the world want to see a sequel. They want to see probably more on the clowns themselves, and obviously they want to see all you guys kicking ass again. So Sweet. Awesome. Sweet. Love it. Grant, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate this. Again, I, I can't give enough thanks for this. This was just a dream come true. And, uh, hey, you're welcome. You're welcome, yeah, man. It's yeah, a man. pleasure. Uh, and I hope everything goes well, and I can't wait to work together again pretty soon. Me too. Uh, Me too. Ladies and gentlemen, if you guys did enjoy today's episode of the Miles Horror Podcast, hit that like button and leave some comments. Let Grant know uh, how much you guys love him, how much you guys love his work. And uh, also, if you guys are new to the channel, hit the subscribe button. Hit that bell notification. Be aware every time we put up new videos. Uh, the more people that come through and the more people that like our content, we will make more content like what we just did with Grant. This was a dream come true for me. Sammy knows that. Anyone who knows me knows that. So uh, thank you guys so much for watching the today's podcast, and we will see you guys soon. Peace. All right. Take it easy, you guys. Peace out.